Okay, so a few days ago I had a surfing accident. This is probably the worst one so far. You're gonna hear dog noises. I've got I'm dog sitting here for Emma's mom. Uh, I got these boys for a couple weeks. Um, but anyway, I've had like minor things where, you know, I'll have a, you know, a wipeout that hurts for maybe a minute or two and I kind of walk it out. But this one I couldn't walk out. And I limped all the way to the car and then when I looked down I saw, you know, I saw like that there was major swelling it's on my calf or it's on my shin kind of so the swelling has gone down but it's still really painful to stand on it so i'm not going to be doing any plein air painting so i thought this would be a great time to do a q a um and uh so i've just been resting and reading uh, which leads right into the q a uh, somebody asked what are you reading so I had a bunch of books going. Um, I kind of read multiple books at one time. I have a Kindle, so I'll read on the Kindle, but I'll also read real books, especially if I go out, uh, you know, if I'm out painting, and a lot of times I'll bring a book and read after I eat lunch or whatever. But uh, this book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, is what I'm reading because it became available uh, for my Kindle via the Libby app from my library. <laughs> if you guys are Kindle people, you know what, I talk, what I'm talking about. So it was ready, I had a hold placed on it. Wanted to reread this book. Uh, it's about Viktor Frankl's experience in a Nazi death camp and uh, trying to find meaning when all meaning seems to be lost and he's just surrounded by suffering. And you would think that this would be a down, downer of a book. It is not, it's actually very inspiring. Um, and I highly recommend it. It's a classic, uh, it's a quick read, easy to read. And, um, and so that's what I'm reading. Uh, and I've really been enjoying the Kindle. I have a Kindle now for like, I guess it's been maybe two months or so. And very cool, very cool. Uh, and it's nice to have, to be able to carry around a bunch of books in one, you know, in one little device. So that's what I'm reading. And um, let's see, the next one is, do you uh, do touch-ups at home? <laughs> Big shift in uh, topics here. So, yeah, as far as like plein air, <laughs> I may be moving around a little bit uncomfortably here. Um, so, yeah, as far as like doing touch-ups, I don't have any like hard and fast philosophy about that. You know, I'm not opposed to touching up a plein air painting. I think there's a lot of painters that, you know, this whole idea of the painting needs to be pure plein air. That, I don't, that doesn't work for me at all. I don't subscribe to that. I, I like the idea of like, I want to get a good painting. The reason I like to paint plein air is because typically I do better work when I'm struggling a little bit. It prevents me from getting formulaic, uh, you see more color, you're more inspired by the, the subject matter in front of you, so I feel like I end up pushing myself, like, I'll give you an example, if I'm standing in front of the ocean, trying to reproduce that in paint is a very intimidating and frustrating, mm, intimidating process because you feel like the paint always falls short of the real thing. But what that does is it pushes you and inspires you to like exaggerate the colors or try to get the motion in there. You, you just, it, it pushes me to, to do more, to try to capture the reality of that scene. Whereas if I was looking at a digital image, I wouldn't have that same inspiration. You know, obviously it's smaller, it's not moving, you know, so, but in any case, what I'm after ultimately is a good painting. So what I, what I find is, is that I get better results from plein air, but oftentimes when I come home, I might have to do a few little touch-ups. My policy is, I wouldn't say it's my policy, but basically what I try to do is I try to get the painting 100% there. Like if I can finish it on site, great. What I've found from my own experience is that the paintings that, like say I get it 75% of the way there, usually that painting will never get finished. It's only the ones that need minor touch-ups, just minor cleanup. Those are the ones that I, I will work on and will eventually like put in a show or make available for sale. So yeah, I do do touch-ups at home, but uh, typically very small touch-ups and I don't do major compositional changes at home. Not at all. Uh, so, okay, how do you ensure that you mix enough color? They're finding that when they mix a color, they'll mix it and then they'll use it and then they run out and then they try to remix the color, but they can't match it. Um, that's not a bad thing, actually. Uh, you could mix using a palette knife and mix large amounts of color. Um, I don't tend to do that. I mean, occasionally I will experiment with like a palette knife mixing up a large amount of color, but usually no. Usually what I do is 
I'll just remix it. I'll keep remixing it and I get close enough that there's, it just, it ends up creating interesting variety, uh, you know, little subtle shifts. But if you're having trouble with that, mix up large amounts with a palette knife and uh, um, a lot of painters do that. So, and I've experimented with it, but for some reason it's like, oh, it's why I use one brush. I want one tool, that's it. Uh, okay, somebody asked, how do I sign my paintings? My smaller paintings, like 12 by 16 and under, I typically, a lot of times I'll just initial those. You know, Chamberlain's kind of a long name. It can be hard to write in paint in a way that's not, I don't want it to be obvious or to interfere with the, with the painting or the composition. So typically what I do is I will use a bit of liquid to thin the paint, but also add binder to it. Liquid and odorless mineral spirits, and I'll use like a number one liner or rigger brush, which is a very fine brush. And I'll either initial on the smaller ones or I will, um, or I'll sign my full name on the larger ones. And again, the reason for using uh, a medium is, is because if I were just to use mineral spirits, then you're breaking down the binder in the paint. The binder in the paint is the oil that holds the pigments together. When you start adding odorless mineral spirits, you're breaking that down into the point where if you varnish the painting, which I do with like Damar retouch varnish typically, uh, or Gamvar. If, if I were just to use odorless mineral spirits to thin the paint to sign my name, when if somebody went to remove the varnish, they'd remove my signature too, or there's a good possibility they would. But if I use something like Liquin, no way. That The binder is so strong, even if I thin it way down, it's gonna make a really durable paint film, or the signature will be really durable. Somebody asked if I use gouache or if I tried gouache. I have not. I am very, like my painting approach is really simple. Like I don't, actually my creative approach or like for visual creativity, you know, I do music and I like to write music and, and that sort of thing. Um, I like woodworking as well, like obviously frames and stuff. But when it comes to the visual thing, like painting, I don't draw, I don't do anything but oil paint. That's it. No gouache, nothing. I like the looks of gouache. I think it can look pretty cool. The one thing I don't like about gouache is the way the finished product, like having to show the finished product. Um, I like that oil paint, you know, that oil paintings are durable, they're tough. You don't need to put glass in front of them. Um, and you know, it's just a frame and then you're looking right at the surface. You don't need to cover it with glass or whatever. So, uh, and I know some people say it's easier because you know, you're using water and I just like the texture and the look of oil paint, and so that's all I do. That's all I do is oil paint, period. <laughs> and there's so much to learn, too, you know? It's like, it takes my full attention, and I'm still, I feel like I'm always still learning, so. And it's not, not to say that, like, gouache, you couldn't learn things from gouache that would apply to oil paint, but anyway. So, the answer is gouache, no. Uh, what does your day look like? Editing, resting, do I paint every day? Uh, I don't paint every day, probably five days a week. And what my day, like like a good day, typically be wake up between somewhere between five and seven, something like that. If I'm going to Santa Cruz, I'll wake up at five in the morning and you've probably seen those videos of breakfast, load up, head down, it takes an hour to get down there surf for an hour and a half maybe, then paint and then go get a burrito, come home, usually kind of nap and read, which is really nice. Like by that time, it's probably one or two in the afternoon. Um, I don't usually edit the same day I film. Like say, let's say I filmed on that particular day and I film twice a week. Um, you know, usually I'll start editing the next day, although I will edit the surf clips. Like I edit those right away. Those are always fun to edit. And that kind of gets the ball rolling on the editing process. Editing takes like a surf clip, maybe an hour. Uh, and then the rest of the video takes between say four to six hours, depending on how much, like if I have additional people, like if I have people in the video that those take longer to edit, um, I want to make sure that they're well represented and, and also that the communication and the flow of the, of the videos really, uh, seems natural and comfortable. Um, so those edits take, yeah, they can take, uh, four to six hours and they are typically on the day after a filming day. So there's two days there. So the filming day would be like that. Then the next day I might paint in the studio or I may just go out and do a plein air painting and then, you know, come back. Well, I'll definitely surf too in the morning, typically surfing in the morning. 
and then and then um, and then painting and then coming back and 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 then laying in bed instead of reading maybe I'll read a bit nap then take a, then edit I don't know it's all very casual but somehow it all gets done everything gets done you know um, so I do have a tremendous amount of freedom and every day is the same pretty much like every day is the same I wake up doesn't matter if it's a weekend or whatever I'm kind of always working a little bit and then I'm resting too I was talking about this like my daughter is very much like me Emma's very much like me it's like this bursts of creativity or activity and then lots of laying around in bed like either reading or editing and that's kind of like it, I, I noticed that she's got that same sort of creative cycle uh, it's really interesting what I try to do on weekends is get out early in the morning surf in the morning and then come home and work on things like frames uh, there's a lot to do for that I've got a show coming up in October it's about four months now and so it's like I want to get stuff done early so I'm building frames on the weekend so that when that show comes up I'm not like in a panic like last year I was kind of in a panic for the six weeks before the show I had so much to do and and I even was planning ahead and it still always amazes me how much work and it's like this is gonna be my eighth solo show at studio or my might be my and then I had two up at Elliot Fout so it could be like my tenth solo show and I'm still learning about the pre the preparation so much work to do uh, and for those of you who haven't seen it's like between 40 and 50 paintings ranging in size from like say 12 by 12 all the way up to three feet by five feet so it's it's a lot of work a lot of work and it build all my frames so it's it's um, yeah a lot of work so this year I'm gonna get started I figured all right, I've already gotten started and built some frames like I said on weekends but I'm gonna try to really be up on my game this time so I don't like I don't stop posting videos like I think it's been years where I've had to abandon everything and just like work on that I don't want to do that okay let's see here what else we have uh, Oh, odors, painting indoors. Somebody wants to know about that. Um, you know, if I paint, oh, I do paint indoors. I'll paint in my kitchen and I'll paint small paintings in here. And if they get larger, I'll go out to my outdoor studio. But uh, I don't really notice, you know, I use Gamsol odorless mineral spirits and then I use a linseed stand oil based uh, uh, medium indoor. So I don't really notice problems with, with odor. I would not use uh, Liquin, which is the medium I use outdoors. I would not use that indoors. I've tried, it gives me a headache, it'll make you nauseous. But it's not really a problem. And I've looked on the Gam, uh, Gamblin website and apparently Gamsol's evaporation rate, the odorless mineral spirits is not, it's like safe, uh, safe to use indoors. I'll put a fan on and I'll open the window if it's not the winter time. But, so I haven't really had issues with that. Uh, do the colors change when they dry? Not really. I haven't noticed the colors change all that much. Um, I think I've heard that that happens with acrylic, but I don't know. I haven't really experimented much with acrylic. But one thing I do notice is like certain colors, like dark colors will go flat. And then when I add varnish, you know, at the end, it kind of, it just makes the colors deeper and richer. So maybe, yeah, maybe they can kind of dry certain areas that dry flat. The color looks different than it does when it's wet. And like I said, that's mostly with dark colors. So yeah, the, 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 what I do is I'll typically either spray with uh, Damar Retouch Varnish or Gamvar Gloss Varnish, both which can be applied when the painting is dry to the touch. So uh, that's what I do there. Um, did I do all the questions? Uh, let's see. Is that it? That's all I've got. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, I guess that's it for the questions. Um, but anyway, so I hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A. Let me know if you've got more questions for the next one, uh, for the next Q&A. Uh, the plan is to hopefully Thursday, by Thursday, I'll be able to get out <clears throat> and paint again. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to rest and uh, read and I might do, actually for Sunday's video or for later in the week, I might do a, a studio cityscape. I've had a lot of people asking about that. I've done a few of those in the past and I've got a lot of cityscapes to do for my show at studio. And what I do with those is typically, I do a bunch of 12 by 12s, usually about 10 12 by 12s. And those are done, in the past they've been done from digital images on my computer. Um, so I think I'm gonna, 
And I'm gonna do a few of those and maybe I'll do a video about that. Let me know what you guys think. But the uh, what I'm gonna try to do this year for my show is have more plein air. Uh, and I've talked about that, so there'll be more urban plein air. I'd like to have more uh, of my cityscapes be painted on location. Um, I think that's the next frontier in cityscapes for me. So anyway, like I said, hope you guys enjoyed this. Let me know if you have more questions down below. Uh, there's also a link down below for um, Patreon. It's uh, the Patreon support that helps keep me making these videos, and I got a bunch of extra videos on there. Uh, the last one was talking about how I key my paintings, I typically keying to the lights. But anyway, I'll talk, I talk about that. That's the sort of thing I put on Patreon, you know, just discussing the nuts and bolts of painting and, um, and it really helps support the channel. So check that out if you want. Other than that, stay creative and I'll see you guys in the next video. Mm -hmm.